Hi guys, Dean here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Ghost Written by David Mitchell. Um, so he's the guy who wrote Cloud Atlas, and this is kind of similar to the, that in that it's kind of crazy and there's lots of different storylines going on, and it's kind of your job as the reader to stitch them all together. Um, kind of a thinker of a book, it's definitely one that I think would, would hold up well to a reread. But as always, I'm going to read the. Uh, do we have a blurb? Yeah, we do have a blurb. Um, so I'm going to read you the blurb on the... No, that isn't a blurb. There isn't a blurb. That's weird. Okay, there is a review, so we're going to... We're going to go with the, the, the top review here from uh, Lawrence Norfolk from The Independent. And then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs and I'll share my overall thoughts I'm making at the end. So... Dane reads... The sarin nerve gas attack in the Tokyo subway leads to a love affair between two semi-Japanese juvenile jazz buffs, then to a tea shack in revolutionary China. From there we are whisked into a rogue soul spiritual progress through Mongolia. Art, fraud and gangsterism in St. Petersburg follow, then philandering, gambling and bad indie rock in London. At various points, ghostwritten could be called a post-Cold War thriller, a love story or several, a court expose, a radio show transcript, an island romance, a compendium of creation myths and, unsurprisingly, Surprisingly, a ghost story. Mitchell juggles these genres with great aplomb. An astonishing debut. And the front of mine is coming off. This is why... Great. I don't really know what to do about that. That's going to have to do. This is why we don't like glossy covers, because they sometimes do that. Anyway, let's check out some tabs. I thought this was funny. One of the this guy's memories... Um, there had been Mr. Ikeda, my homeroom teacher from high school, and two or three of the worst bullies. My biological father had appeared too. I remember that day when the bullies had got everyone in the class to pretend that I was dead. By afternoon it had spread through the whole school. Everyone pretended they couldn't see me. When I spoke they pretended they couldn't hear me. Mr. Ikeda got to hear about it, and as a society appointed guardian of young minds, what did he take it upon himself to do? The bastard conducted a funeral service for me during the final homeroom hour. He even lit some incense and led the chanting and everything. <laughs> that is quite funny as well though. I like this little line. I pulled open my map. I've always preferred maps to books. They don't answer you back. And so he's part of this court and we get, uh, what had gone wrong? A few more months and my alpha quotient would have been 25, putting me in the top 200 on earth. His serendipity had assured me in person. I had ingested some of his serendipity's eyelashes. After winning converts on the welcome program, I was rewarded with a test tube of the guru's sperm to imbibe. Mmm. And uh, Takeshi seeing an engaged woman, which adds the thrill of adultery while subtracting any responsibility. Only shag women who have more to lose than you do, was a motto of his. He sounds like a right prick. And he's talking about the TV. A bright, brash place, always well lit, full of fun and jokes that tell you when to laugh so you never miss them. World news carefully edited so that it's not too disturbing, but disturbing enough to make you glad that you weren't born in a foreign country. News with music to tell you who to hate, who to feel sorry for, and who to laugh at. Well, actually it says, and who laugh at? I don't know if that's a typo or not, to be honest. We get this little bit here. I remember you said you enjoyed The Great Gatsby. There's a new Murakami translation of Fitzgerald short stories we've just brought out. The Lord of the Flies, that's laugh a minute. And a new Garcia Marquez. And this book, to me, feels very inspired by Murakami. So I think that might have been a little hat tip to him, you know? We get the line, it's not like we've fallen longingly in love with each other. Which just annoys me. I hate those unnecessary uh, adverbs. And this sounds like me. There's a mechanism in my alarm clock connected to a switch in my head that sends a message to my arm which extends itself and commands my thumb to punch the off button a moment before the thing beeps me awake. Every morning without fail, no matter how much whiskey I drank the night before or what time I finally get to bed, I've forgotten. And this makes me laugh because I kind of relate to this. How many times have I dreamed of computers? I'd keep a dream diary, but one, but even that might be used to help nail me one day. I imagine reporters printing the screwier ones and prison analysts discussing the poor ones in supermarket aisles. I wonder who had the first computer dream, where and when. I wonder if computers ever dream of humans. Which, uh, I've just read Host by Peter James, and that line would have fit in quite well there, because it was about kind of giving humans, uh, computers consciousness. Great line here. When you call yourself a plonker, nobody ever disagrees with you. And this will be uh, relatable to anybody who's ever had to get the bus to work. Standing room only on the bus, but I don't mind. It reminds me of being crushed on the dear old circle line back in dear old Blighty. The cricket season will be starting now. That's why I like this bus. From the moment I get on it until the moment I enter the office, everything is out of my hands. I don't have to decide anything. I can zombify. I used to just sit there reading on the bus. It was great. Little line here. Those, those kids in the coffee bar last night, they were who love was for. Not us old fucks over 30. Forget it. I'm 33, mate, and I'm in love. I get a reference from watching Die Hard 3 dubbed into Cantonese. I like Die Hard, good movies. So we get this pretty disturbing bit. Uh, outside Le Chan, there's a village where a pig roast was held two days ago. So, said my cousin, my nephew swallowed. They haven't had pigs there since the famine. So, I croaked. 
Three days ago, the Commune Committee was shot for embezzling the people's buttercream. Guess what? Guess who? They put in the pot. Attendance at the pig roast was compulsory on pain of execution, so everyone shares in the guilt. Pot or shot? Damn, that's dark. Great little line. I added writers to my list of people not to trust. They make everything up. Another great line. Sometimes language can't even read the music of meaning. Another line I loved. So in the Falkland Islands, I watched them fight over rocks. Two bald men fighting over a comb, an ex-host commented. And an incredible insult here. Look, you tapeworm-infested, dung-puddled peasant bitch with bad teeth. Here is how our little interview works. I have to remember that one, but it's quite a wordy one. We get this exchange where someone goes, We both know there's no such thing as love. What do you call it? Mutations of wanting. Great line. When a man blows his nose, you don't call it love. Why get all misty-eyed when a man blows another part of his anatomy? Lust is the hard cell. Love is the soft cell. The profit margin is exactly the same. We get this great little bit here. It's strange and it makes me sad, I thought, that a place carries on without you after you've left. Tatiana nodded. It's the world slapping you in the face and saying, Look, honey bunch, I get along without you very well. The sea does the same thing, but nobody lives there. It hurts more if it's a place where you've grown up or worked or fallen in love. So this is dark, but interesting. Did you know that in the 13th century, the Mongolians used to seal their captives in airtight containers and conduct feasting atop the box, listening to the sounds of suffocation? Man, they knew how to party, right? Great line here. Killing is a sensation like abortion or birth that you can never accurately imagine. And we get the English are a devious race, a nation of homosexuals, vegetarians, and third-rate spies. A little line here. When I was a kid, I used to pretend I was a locomotive. What kid doesn't? I, I never did that. That's about when, like, you can breathe and you can see your breath, you know? I'm meditating on the, uh, on chance. We get that short woman in an orange anorak wandering across the road in front of that taxi with the driver mentally stripping the leggy woman striding past with a flopsy dog. Why is she about to be mown down and not me? Fuck. So he goes and rescues her. We get a reference to Joe Orton, who I'd never heard of until recently uh, when I read... Uh, Prick Up Your Ears, which is a screenplay Alan Bennett wrote based on uh, a biography of Joe Orton. I like this as a Graham Greene fan. Imagine one of the more tedious Graham Greene novels, remove the good bit towards the end, and have it just going on and on for hundreds of pages. Um, that was what somebody's life was like in the Secret Service. We've got the line here, ghostwriters like psychiatrists have to know when to shut up. It's very true. Great little line here. Italians give their cities sexes, and they all gr agree that the sex for a particular city is quite correct, but none of them can explain why. I love that. London's middle-aged and male, respectably married, but secretly gay. Another great line, again, I can relate to this as someone who does ghostwriting. You know the real drag about being a ghostwriter? You never get to write anything that beautiful, and even if you did, nobody would ever believe it was you. We get the line, he's as nutty as a vegan T-bone. Team vegan. We get a line here. Silver's not a very well woman. Her eyelids are raw pink and on her worst days they're red and cracked. One of the regulars, Mrs Entwistle, told me that Silver had lost the baby she was carrying on the night of the bomb. How do people pull themselves through things like that? I go to pieces just opening my credit card bills. But people do survive all around us. The world runs on strangers coping. I love that last line there. We get someone who says putain, which is a great uh, French swear word. It kind of means whore. Little line, technology is repeatable miracles. Kind of reminds me of that um, Alfred uh, C. Clarke quote where he said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. We get a reference to war and peace and someone says a lot of it about, particularly the former. And they're talking about the future of the human race and we get in 500 years we are going to either be extinct or something better. I think we're probably going to be extinct to be honest. And a little, little kind of exchange here. But you're a writer, they are lunatics. Lunatics are writers whose works write them back. Not all lunatics are writers, Mrs. Ray, believe me. But most writers are lunatics, but believe me. So this end part, uh, all of this end section is like a transcript of a radio show at the end of the world. So some of these um, rules for living a good life. Never have affairs with women who have less to lose than you do. Don't jump red lights, at least not if there's a cop waiting. Support gifted buskers. Never vote for anyone crooked enough to claim they're honest. Acquire wealth, pursue happiness. Don't take the handicapped parking space. Just a cracking line here. I've never had a mammal up my anus, bat. We get a reference to the World Trade Center, which kind of dates this book for obvious reasons. And just a reference to someone having blood type O negative, which is my blood type. So yeah, Ghost Written by David Mitchell. It's one of those books where 
it's very disjointed and it's done that way deliberately. You kind of have to get to the end of it to understand how it all fits together. And even then, I mean, I think I could reread this three or four times and I still wouldn't get everything that it was trying to say. Um, but overall, it was well written still. Pretty good for a debut novel too. It's one of those, if you enjoyed Cloud, Cloud Atlas, you're going to like Ghostwritten because they're kind of similar styles and obviously the same author. Um, I actually preferred Mitchell's like more linear stuff though, to be honest. So I really enjoyed Black Swan Green. I thought that was great. This was pretty good though. I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5 and would recommend it if you're interested in getting to know some more of David Mitchell's stuff. So there we have it, that's what I made of Ghost written by David Mitchell. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.